Hello, and welcome to season two of Career Resilience, where we talk with people about their career path and their career journey, and maybe we can all learn from each other. My name is Jan Daniluk, and I'm a human resources consultant in London, Ontario, Canada. I work with Ford Keist LLP, providing human resources advice and counsel to my business clients. I also support people through individual one-on-one -on -one coaching in helping with career development. I hope you will enjoy our series where we talk with ordinary, extraordinary people. We get to hear about interesting journeys. We get to talk with people about failures, successes, advice, and counsel to us as we develop our own careers. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with these people, and I hope you will enjoy listening to us. And now for some logistics, please subscribe on YouTube, or if you're a listener, please follow me wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have a chance, I hope you'll visit my website, career-resilience.com. Welcome. Hello, and my guest today is the Honorable Ed Holder, Mayor of London. Sorry, Ed, I had to kind of read that because it's a lengthy title, but welcome to Career Resilience. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so on career resilience, as, an, as the name implies, we talk about people's careers and um, about how they've had to be resilient because we have to be resilient when, when we uh, go through our life in all aspects, but we wanna talk about career. And you have had a particularly fascinating career, which I divide up into entrepreneurship and and political life. Those to me are your two aspects of your career. How do you divide your career up? Probably into uh, three things. Uh, certainly uh, entrepreneurship, that's how I started, particularly when I came back to London. Uh, the second uh, would be the political components and I've had a couple of different roles uh, in that capacity. And the third is community involvement. And I really feel that you can't uh, ignore uh, any of those pieces if you want to get a better understanding of who I am. Okay, so the three segments, that makes sense. Okay. I'd like to start with saying that you are the mayor of London, Ontario, and which is where we both reside. And we have a population of about 400, approximately 400,000 people, I think is where we well, are. As, as the crow flies without including the the greater metropolitan area, we're at about 430,000 now. So it grew by almost 10% since your conversation, since you just said what you said. Oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't realize that. So let's talk about you and your career, Ed. And let's just leap into what is your thought process and definition about resilience? It's a big question. Um, I would say um, resilience means never giving up. Mm -hmm. uh, having focus and purpose and uh, driving to that uh, focus and uh, that purpose. So, so to me, uh, I've applied those principles uh, in everything I've done. I've been involved in some 40 different community organizations in my time, uh, chaired most of them. Uh, and some are total charity, some are business related organizations but I always thought a leader's role is to lead. And so that's tied very comfortably into my community piece. Um, I've never not included community involvement with my business life. And I think that has stood me in, in great stead because you meet some really special people along the way. You have a better understanding of your community. You get a better sense of what the needs are. And I'm not talking for political purposes, just for being a decent human being. Yeah. So from my standpoint, never give up. Uh, I got to read something to you. And it actually was from a president of the United States. And I think it ties in. And, uh, and, and Calvin Coolidge, and I'm going to read this to you if I can, because it's a mantra that, uh, that I carry with me. And I've had this little piece of paper, this one here, for the longest time. I'm going to share it with uh, your audience. Here's how it goes. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. 
the slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Mm. And that's a mantra that you have carried through your career? Through my career, uh, Calvin was born well ahead of me, long gone now, but I will say uh, I picked up this uh, missive many years ago and it just struck me as so important. And, and there's some things I take from that. Uh, never give up, as I said earlier, I think that's important. Yeah. And you know, you've heard the adage, uh, you don't succeed if you haven't failed. Well, I've had my share of failing and I've had my share of successes. Success is more fun, by the way. But uh, I will tell you that, that it's truly important that you never give up and uh, press on. Mm -hmm. And so you just keep going and uh, you do it with a good heart, good intentions and be honorable about it. And uh, some pretty good things can happen from that. So since you mentioned uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, who, as you were growing up, were your influencers? Bobby Kennedy was one. I, uh, when, when I, so my family is from Cape Breton and Holderville, New Brunswick, you can't make that up. And uh, they came to Upper Canada for just economic betterment. When I was 10, they followed some family down to California for economic betterment. So I was 10 years old, lived there for five years. And I was very active in Bobby Kennedy's campaign, delivering flyers and the like. And what a tragedy when he was killed. But, uh, but you know what? I loved his compassion. Uh, I loved the fact that he was so articulate. And his heartfelt responses to issues of that moment in time, uh, I think were particularly salient. And those always struck a chord with me. Uh, but from my standpoint, I, it's probably fair to say that I learned politics at my mom's knee and about community service. Uh, my mom would always say, uh, community service is the price you pay to live somewhere. And I've tried to incorporate that in everything that I do. So I talk a lot about community because I think of all, if, if, if the only thing that defines success is how much money you've made, well, listen, I've made a lot and I've lost a lot. Um, and it's not the measuring stick. It is for some and okay. But for me, it's, uh, you know, when it's all done, you're not putting the, the, the dollars in your casket. So the question becomes, uh, if your reputation means something to you, uh, then what's that gonna look like when you're gone? You know, my Cape mom would also say, you've got two things in your life, your name and your integrity. And you don't mess up one without messing up the other. No. So she had a lot of, Cape Bretonisms that I love to share, but she was probably the biggest influencer in my life, and uh, and and really, I think drove home to me how important it is to be a decent human being and work hard. And you know, she never said never give up, but she, that's what she meant. Cape Bretoners are fierce, and they never give up. And no. uh, I don't think they have the <laughs> option to give up, Ed. I well, wanted to it, ask you, when you were growing up, what did you say you wanted to be? I always find that interesting. A priest. A priest. Yeah, I remember, uh, again, uh, likely my mom's encouragement. So being raised Catholic, I was an altar boy, and then I was taking courses at the Jesuit seminary. And I remember coming home when I was 15 years old. And, I, and it was probably one of the most nervous times in my life when I said to my mom, I don't think I can be a priest. And she said, why is that boy? I said, I think I like girls. <laughs> so she, uh, so you, you know what she said? She was great. And she took all the pressure off. And she said, you know, that's fine. But you know, for the years that you were thinking of this and, and the like, uh, I knew you were gonna be on the straight. And, uh, and it was so important to her, but I was so relieved when that discussion was done. So that was kind of my first thought. Uh, and then the second, because of the political side, and my Cape Breton grandfather ran for federal politics in Cape Breton Island. You know, um, you and I are both from Nova Scotia, which we discovered. No, no, Cape Breton, let's okay. be clear. Well, yes, my mother's from Cape Breton as well, but because my family lived all over Nova Scotia. But it's really interesting when you say that, because uh, we always had friends with big 
families and big uh, uh, Catholic families. And there was always supposed to be one of the boys who would go into the priesthood. That, that was a source of real pride um, back then. So it's just interesting. Well, it was a temporary placement for me. That's all it was. <laughs> so from there, um, I was involved in student politics in Toronto at Malvern Collegiate. I was the president of the Students Council. And um, I recall it was half 12 and half of grade 13. You split the two years as president. And I was accepted at Centennial College to go into marketing. And I went to my principal at the end of grade 12. And I said, I can't finish my term. Uh, I'm going to college. And he asked me to explain what I was doing. I mentioned Centennial. He said, you're not going there. I said, I thought I was. He said, no, you're going to go to Western. I said, why Western? And he said, well, you know what, you and I, with our conversations, you've had kind of a business bent. And that's uh, in some ways how you've, uh, you've handled the, the council's finances at, uh, at uh, Malvern. And he said, you're going to go to Western. They've got the best business school in Canada. So I said, where's Western? He said, London. I said, where's London? <laughs> so anyway, to shorten the story, I went to Western, got involved in student politics there. And then I thought I might go into law. Uh, and I had really strong LSAT scores, but my, uh, uh, my marks were pretty average, not good enough to get into Western's law school. So I ended up doing philosophy. Uh, philosophy is in now, in retrospect, is a link to everything because it involves critical thinking. And you get into things like philosophy of logic, uh, philosophy of morality, and uh, and then political philosophy. And so those things really captured me. And if I've had some success, I credit uh, my degree uh, because of the applications that, uh, that, uh, that were involved in, in, in how you approach your life in general and more specifically your, uh, what's important. And values are, the, are so important to me. I think it's interesting because I would naturally have thought that you would have gone in a business direction rather than a philosophy direction, just because of your entrepreneurial bent. So well, you know, that's what, uh, that's what Prime Minister Stephen Harper said to me when, uh, uh, when I was appointed to cabinet, I was federal minister of science and technology for two years. And his comment to me was, he said, now, Ed, I know you might've imagined that, uh, that I would put you into a portfolio that had more business application based on my background. And he said, but you'll be shocked on the uh, science, technology, innovation component, how business ties in. And he was 100% correct. I went to every university across this country, uh, most of the colleges, uh, many of the business incubators and uh, research facilities across the country. And my responsibility was to, uh, put in place a five-year plan for a science uh, uh, research technology and innovation. And I had to develop that Canadian strategy that was going to last Canada five years. And I did that in 2014 December, and it lasted till December, 2019. So it ran its five-year course and uh, the prime minister and I were side by each when uh, we announced the, uh, the strategy for Canada. And uh, what an honor that was. But I'll tell you, uh, all, we are all the sum of everything we've ever done. So whether it's being student council president, uh, thinking I might be a priest, uh, being involved in student politics at Western, getting a degree in philosophy, a couple of summer jobs on uh, the railroad as a steward, uh, and eventually ending up uh, because of my relationships and connections, uh, meeting a fellow who was with the Prudential Insurance Company in uh, now, then in Newark, which was the uh, national headquarters, international headquarters for Prudential. And uh, we were playing golf, me badly, by the way, and still. And he was saying, what about a career in insurance? And I said to him, I, I said, Bob, I didn't go to university to sell insurance. He said, no, 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 I don't sell insurance. He was an IT, he was head of IT internationally for Prudential. He said, go in their head office and, and maybe that's your path. And I had a 
and, and so I had an interview. I always wanted to work at IBM because there was a pal of mine who from university days and he was a graduate and worked at IBM and he always had the best clothes, the best teeth, the best car, best clothes. And I thought that's where I want to be is IBM. So I had the interview with Prudential. They offered me the position to start in a couple of months. And then uh, uh, IBM called and I said, I can't. I've accepted another position, even mm. though I hadn't started. It was honorable to do that. Yeah. So I started with Prudential and I, and I was replacing a fellow who was going to Ryerson for journalism. And I was only in the role six months. And uh, the fellow said, journalism is ridiculous. He wanted to go back to private sector. And they hired him back because he was brilliant. And so there were two fellows in a position they budgeted for one. So the manager of the department, this is employee benefits, said, um, why don't you apply for the supervisor's job? It's just come up. And I remember saying to Bill, I said, look, I've never been fired from a job in my life, all part-time at that point. And so don't, you, don't ask me to post for a position and, you know, and somebody fills it, I'll just resign. And he was a little rude. And he said, would you apply for the job? And so I did and I got it. And uh, I became a supervisor after six months with limited experience, but with an opportunity and an open mind. And they gave you course after course. And the other thing I would say to anyone that when these opportunities happen, including courses and things, you can always say yes. It's easy to say no. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I've got other things. Always say yes. And when you do that, it's interesting how opportunities open up. 1981 happened. So here I am when 20 six years old. I had a house up in Stouffville on four acres, which I had them today. And, but I couldn't afford my mortgage because people talk about mortgages today and, oh. and you know, that rates are pretty low. Well, mine renewed in, uh, in, uh, uh, at that time in 1981 at 22.2%. Yeah. I thought I was going to die. So I sold the house and moved to London because I'd gone to school here. So that was my connection to London. That was in 81. That was 40 years ago. I'm starting to feel like a local now, but I'll tell you, I didn't know anybody. So I did three things when I moved to London. I joined the Chamber of Commerce because I thought that would be good for business. I joined the Rotary Club of London because I felt that would be important for community service. And because I lived in old South London, I joined the community organization there because a neighbor said I had to. And I went on, I, ironically, I went on to become president of the Chamber of Commerce the sergeant at arms for Rotary and president of the Old South Community Organization. And all it means is that if you miss a meeting, you become president. And uh, from my standpoint, uh, those opportunities and those connections and those relationships are ones that I carry to this day. As, as you look back at your career, what was something in your career that you were incredibly proud of? I know you mentioned about being part of the cabinet. That's incredible. Uh, what else comes to mind as something that you're just so proud of? Well, it's going to sound odd, but I would say uh, my network. Uh, one of the things that, that people don't do really well is they don't know how to network. They don't know how to they, can, they may make a connection, but they don't know how to hold on to it. And some will discard the relationship because they haven't talked to somebody in two, three, five years, 10 years. And I'm living proof that people come back into your life. I had uh, a person I went to Malvern Collegiate over 40 years ago who connected with me on LinkedIn and said, do you remember me? And I remember her very well. And uh, so we just reestablish re a connection. But one of the things that is so critical for anyone's business success and personal success is the power of networking. I even give a little course, the five steps to being the greatest networker in the world. And, and it's pretty simple stuff, but it's about having an electronic tracking system, not a bunch of business cards stuffed in your drawer. It's putting the tombstone information, you know, the typical name, email, uh, phone, address, that sort of thing. It has to have an open notes section so you can indicate each contact. So Jan, when uh, we're done, I'm going to say that today on uh, September 22nd, McHappy Day, uh, that, uh, that we had a, a nice chat about career resilience and that sort of thing. We did a little podcast. And, and, and so what I've got is I've got the date, I've got the time and place. So it's a Zoom call and the like, but in that way we stay connected. Yeah. Um, 
And it doesn't matter that you and I might not have chatted for a few years at your office some time ago, and it was several years ago. But I will tell you, I don't forget that. And I know uh, your sweetheart, and he and I stay in touch. Yep. And, and, and you just don't know how people come back into your life and how that, that can be so helpful. Right. Uh, I keep track of everybody. And I wish if I had a message to people, it's take networking seriously. Learn how to do it right. And never discard a contact because you never know how people come back into your life. And networking matters, whether you're a philosophy major or somebody who uh, works in retail or somebody who's a homemaker or because everybody has a dream whatever that dream may be. And we can't do it alone. If we think we are, then, you know, this conversation is not for them. But I think uh, what I'm starting to appreciate is uh, we become a worldwide family. And certainly with uh, the internet and with all the various tools we have, there's no reason why we can't stay connected. And LinkedIn is not your, it might be a social network, but it is not your networking tool. It is a part of that. So I'll, I'll call it a tool, but you know, I use a database. And uh, here's a fun fact. I'm gonna ask you a question now, Jane. You've been asking me the questions. How many people have you met in your life? Thousands. Yes, that's not the right answer, but how many exactly? I have no idea would be the answer to that. Well, it's an impossible question <laughs> because when we, but when we start to think, you say thousands, but when you start to think of when you're in grade school, and junior and high school and college or university and extra courses you've taken, sports you've played, coaching, extra interests, volunteering, politics, uh, family get togethers, um, uh, yeah. old mates get togethers, events, uh, seances, it doesn't matter, whatever it all is, uh, you start to put that together. Here's the, here's the answer to that. Um, and it's not precise, but for every year old we are, we've met at least a thousand people. So if we think about that, how many people over the years that we let just kind of uh, fall through our fall through our hands, fall through the cracks? Because we sit and we'd say, "Gosh, whatever happened to?" Well, you know, I don't mean ancestry.com, but I really mean in terms of the present, in terms of the people that we've met. Right. And uh, you know, I was just in New Brunswick, uh, my uh, in Holderville, because my dad's older sister just passed away, and the funeral was on the weekend. And I met some family that I hadn't met yet, because that'll happen. And uh, adding them now to my database, because that's important just to stay in touch. You have to be sincere when you do that. But you never know how that comes back to help you. And I really want to stress with anyone who's paying mind to this uh, podcast, that you can never underscore the critical importance of networking. And the better you are at it, again, done with sincerely and with a good heart, uh, so not with, I'll say, ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. uh, to do it because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, because yeah, I'll come back to what my Cape Breton mother also said. She said, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's givers and takers. And if you surround yourself with givers, you're going to be okay. So that's kind of the spirit that I take with that. And I maintain track of everyone. And now in my capacity as mayor of the city of London, uh, I'm meeting hundreds and hundreds more people every year. And... Uh, and, and it's a lot of work to keep because it's one thing to put it in, input it, then people change their lives uh, or they update their circumstance. And so you've got to put all that information in, keep it updated and it's work. But as of today, I've got 27,916 contacts. How many hours do you work in a week, including your networking and your role? How, how many hours do you devote? It varies. Uh, never less than 50 and sometimes 80 hours, because in a sense, you're on call. Uh, last night, I spoke to the premier at my home, and we had about a 20-minute chat about something I was asking him to consider. Uh, and, 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 and so you don't kind of turn the switch off. No. And, and you should, by the way, but in the capacity, in a political capacity, you don't have that, you don't always have that privilege to do that. And I consider it a privilege when you get like private time, nothing better than to have a weekend and I don't have an event, but that rarely happens. But Ed, are you um, an extreme extrovert? I didn't grow up that way. Uh, I was, you know, I was fairly quiet. I remember 
speaking to my mom uh, when uh, when my dad passed away. They both died uh, here in London at our home, and uh, and it was shortly after my dad's passing. I just kind of used that as my recollection time. And, and I said, Mom, how come it was never good enough for you with me? And she said, what do you mean? I said, you know, do you remember in California, they have what they call the 3.70 society. It's an academic in school. So 4.0 is a perfect mark. 3.70 is like an A minus. And I said, every quarter, I, I, you know, school was, it came reasonably. I'd get a 3.73 and I'd say, she'd say, what happened to the 0.27? I'd get a 3.91. She'd say, what happened to the 0.09? And one quarter, I got a 4.0, and she said nothing. And uh, I remember, this will shock you, but I ran second fastest in the mile in Southern California for my age group. And she said, what about the kid that came in first? I said, Mom, how come it was never good enough for you? And she said, well, son, I always thought there would be people that would say nice things about you, but I never wanted your head to get so big you couldn't get through a door. So I grew up pretty quiet because um, you weren't allowed to extol your virtues and because that'd be bragging and 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 mom was fierce on that uh ironically my dad was quiet probably a survival instinct i think but uh so it took a while for me to realize that you have to reach out and you have to do more people would consider me extroverted because i make the effort but it is an effort it's it's not a natural tendency i have and uh so, so it's a funny question because I would, I, I would say that it's a learned skill to be uh, more extroverted. Um, I'd be remiss not to ask you as uh, someone in the role of, of the mayor of a, of a big city, um, what are the most challenging aspects to you personally of being in that job? Uh, well, we're talking about the 10th largest city in Canada. First, I gotta, I gotta declare that. Uh, I would say probably family time. It it suffered a lot when I was in federal politics because I'd be five days out of seven in Ottawa or wherever, and when I became a minister, it was seven days out of seven. Sometimes even my two grandbabies uh, during that period uh, kind of grew up without me or me without them. And I really felt that I suffered from that. Um, it could be like that if you don't establish some limits. Mm -hmm. So my staff are pretty good. They try to schedule some uh, quiet time for me and private time. But again, it's a bit of a 24-7 role. So I would say the toughest part uh, is, uh, is family time. And if I talk about from a professional standpoint, um, you can't satisfy everybody these two Western students who came in with an ask. I said, uh, I, I said, you'll send me a note with the details. I'm really big at that now. So if there's a, if somebody needs to see me, I haven't, I asked them for an agenda. I do all of that, but, but you have to be candid. You can't say, Oh, I'll do my very best. Of course you will, but, but you can't give people a false expectation. And I said to these uh, young gentlemen, I said, I don't think we can get where you need to get to, but I will make the effort. I'll make the connection uh, to where they needed to go. And then it's in the hands of somebody else. So I'm a connector. It's what I do. And I guess I get disappointed when I, I can't give happy endings because in the role of politics, you like to please people where you can. Mm -hmm. But it's um, it's an impossible task. Certainly, it's never 100%. And it's usually a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But you do it honorably and, and, and you do your best. And, um, and that's, I think, all people can ask. But sometimes people ask a little bit more. Yeah. I, I also wanted to ask you um, the role of, of your partner, your, your, your spouse in, in your career. How has that, having that support helped you? Oh, I don't think uh, uh, I could be anywhere I am without uh, Judith. She is an entrepreneur in her own right. She owns Razzle Dazzle Cupcakes and a chocolate shop and a gift basket company. My daughter's in the business now, has been for a number of years. My daughter's taking over it. Uh, so my wife's busy planning our retirement. You need someone who's exceptionally understanding and, uh, and supportive, and she's both, and very bright. Yeah, 
and as you say, an entrepreneur in her own right and a career woman in her own right, which is, is pretty impressive. In this season of career resilience, I'm asking each person three questions. And I'm going to spin that into my blog on my on my website. So I wanted to ask you those three questions. Um, first question is, what has been the best career advice you received? It probably came from Doug Baker, and it was uh, something I've something I believed uh, and said a little bit already, and that is the two idioms: never give up, always say yes. And I don't mean being silly, but I'm talking about uh, being open and receptive to opportunities. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't think you're ready, like when I took on that supervisory yeah. role, which was the first major one, I had no experience in that. When I set up my own company in London, Ontario in 1981, I didn't know a soul. And some people said, where are you going? I said, London. They said, oh my God, London. And I said, what's wrong with London? Oh, that cold place. It's people aren't friendly. It's horrible. And, you know, there's a great little story of a stranger uh, who comes to a new town and he sees an old man at the edge of town. And he said, old man, I'm new here. Can you tell me about your town? And he said, well, tell me about where you're from. And he said, well, the people there were not nice. They weren't friendly. They didn't treat you like you were uh, part of the community. And, and I hated it. And the man said, I'm sorry. The old man said, I'm sorry. Our town is just like that. Next day, another stranger comes up, sees the same old man and said, old man, I'm new to your town. Can you tell me about your place? The old man again says, well, tell me about what it was like where you were. And he said, uh, amazing. He said, people couldn't do enough for you. You'd speak with them. They talk back in a, in a great way. They couldn't be more helpful, very kind. I loved it there. And, uh, and the old man said, well, you're in luck. Our town is just like that. So there's a moral to that story, Jan. Number one, don't talk to old men sitting at the side of town. And, and, and secondly, it, it really does depend on how you approach your, your life. The second question, is there a book that you've read which influenced your, your style or your approach to, to your career in any way? I'm actually more of a fiction uh, reader. I, um, I love Wilbur Smith. I love Bryce Courtney and Tom Clancy for fun. But the book I like most of all now, I just happen to have one here. I'll share it with you. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Is We Walking the Journey of Life, One Woman's Courageous Walk Through Life, Grief, and Faith. And who's that? I don't, I'm that's, not... written by, that's written by my wife. By your wife? My wife never thought, my wife, Judith wrote that. And she never thought of herself as an author. But some people, um, your listeners wouldn't know we lost our boy when he was 14 in a car accident and uh, it changes everything all your perspectives and um and we never thought we could pick up the pieces it was just too impossible and it was in the first year it was probably without question the worst year of our lives together and individually and it was just horrible i mean it just you can't imagine so my wife walked the Camino. This is her profile in courage. And the Camino is this, um, this path you take uh, ending up in Spain. And it can start in Spain. It can start in Portugal or France. And you end up at a cathedral. Uh, and uh, and she, she walked for 11 days. And it was so important for her to do it. She ended up... Uh, uh, during a walk on what would have been my boy's 30th birthday. And uh, so one of the stories in the book talks about her seeing all the kind of dull shrubbery that was uh, there. And every day it was the same walking goat trails, mountain trails, some roads. And on, on my boy's 30th birthday, she, uh, she started her walk, started the wrong way. <laughs> Had to turn around because people were already it was early in the morning and no sooner had she turned a corner than there was a huge bush of yellow roses and it was my son's favorite color and his favorite flower so she was blown away because she and she mm -hmm. said he's on the walk with me so she did her camino and uh, and it was so important to her 
and important to me because it was important to her. And I said, I'll come with you if you like. I had a few days. I probably would have had to stop partway through to get back to, to Ottawa then. And she said, no, 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 this is my journey. So when she came back, she'd taken some pictures and things and she uh, uh, decided to do almost like a travel log for folks. And she's not a natural speaker. She, if I was shy at the beginning, she was, she's incredibly shy. But she came out of her shell to do that. And people said, you've got a book in you. And she said, no. Well, bridge that story. She decided she would do something for our grandchildren. Because here's the problem with oral history is that it dies as my 103 year old aunt died on the weekend. Um, you know, that's a lot of oral history that's gone. But when you write it down, maybe you can put your own spin on it, but it's, but it's history. So she started with her own family life and how her parents moved from Portugal to Africa. My wife was born in Africa, came to Canada just to find me. Now she tells it differently, but same effect. And the uh, and and then us growing up together, uh, losing our boy, dealing with things that you have to, and the lessons that that she picked up from the Camino, like it's a powerful little read. Yeah. So she sells them out of razzle dazzle cupcakes, and that's fine, and and it's never to make a lot of money, but to inspire. And I think that that's part of our job, is that we have an obligation, I think, to inspire where we can. Yeah, I'm pretty practical and a realist, but at the same time, you have to give people confidence. And I think the greatest gift we can give anyone, be it our sweethearts, be it our kids, be it our colleagues, is confidence. It's one of the big, big challenges of today. Yes. And, uh, and she gives me confidence every day, and that's the blessing I have with her. Yeah, I, I have to say that, um, that giving people confidence and being empathetic would really go a long way in our in our world right now. Uh, the third question I have is that um, you've had an incredibly and continue to have an incredibly unique career, very challenging career. Um, I mean, just so impressive. Um, what advice? What would you tell your younger self? <laughs> wow, that's a question and a half. When you've made a little bit of money, don't give it to one financial institution. <laughs> that would be one uh, one thing. Uh, <laughs> when I sold my my insurance, I gave all my money to uh, to uh, one investment firm to to invest. It was a considerable amount of money, and it ended up as zero, and uh, because the stock market crash, and it was like starting over again, if you can imagine, and uh, and that created a lot of stresses. So I. I would say be balanced um, is what I would tell myself. Uh, don't, you know, we have a tendency to, I, I don't want to use the expression necessarily bet the farm, but I thought this was a safe thing. I'm going back to the financial thing for a moment, but it was devastating. And that wasn't that many years ago. So you think about that and it takes your breath away. Um, so the other thing I would say is buy land. <laughs> That's what I would have done as a kid. Uh, because you know, it's interesting. When people make their plans, it's not necessarily long, long-term. I would tell you the people that, that uh, I, I look at our own community here and from a financial standpoint, uh, some of the most successful people are in the, uh, the housing and commercial development business. That's not a surprise necessarily to uh, people listening. But you know, when I look at these people, each of them, uh, all phenomenally successful and, and sons or daughters of phenomenally successful. One came out of a concentration camp. One came here illiterate. One, uh, a couple, I mean, they all came poor. There's one uh, great friend of mine who came uh, as a 16 year old, couldn't speak English, didn't have much of an education. Uh, took his invalid mother, she couldn't walk, and had to walk her up three flights of stairs to the little rooming house they had when they moved to London, and uh, took any job just to make ends meet, and broke his arm, and but he couldn't pay the rent and pay for the food, and he was the caregiver for the family, the breadwinner, 
So he took the, he actually used a razor blade to cut the cast off and went back to work with a broken arm because mm -hmm. he did what he had to do. And I think that's the point, do what you have to do. And, and you know, I don't regret uh, where I've ended up, but I certainly will tell you that if I'd had the wisdom or the insight and the knowledge, which none of us will get, it's easier to look through the rear view mirror than to look ahead. And so I would, I would just say be balanced and find balance in your life. That's what I would have told me to do and to make haste a little more slowly. Yeah. Um, thank you for this time, Ed. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Anything that you'd like to say to finish off? That's always a journalist question, you know, oh. at the end, because they, because at the end, they want to see if there's, any, it's different with you, but the journalists always ask that. And you left out anything you'd like to add. That's the trap question normally. Not oh, here. Okay. See, I'm an incredible resources person, Ed. I, I didn't realize that. You could be a journalist, you see. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess as an overall, whatever you do, do it with a good heart. Uh, never give up. Be persistent. And do do it principle with principles, and uh, and and maybe in this day and age more than ever, be kind to each other. These are challenging times for a lot of people, and I get it. You know, I feel very blessed to be where I am, and and we certainly had our share of hardships. But you know, you you can either dwell on those and let them let them kill you, yeah, uh, or you go forward. But I think people in the various stages of their lives uh, to be a little anger to each other because people we don't know people's stories we don't know what they're going through and if we're just a little bit kinder then uh, and, and and reach out i think that would make a great difference in in our own humanity yeah i, I think those are great words to end by so thank you very much for chatting with me jan you've made this delightful and i appreciate you giving me the time as well so to our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining Ed and me today. I think there are so, so many stories in his career that would be so fascinating to, to delve into even more because there's been so many peaks and valleys and, and isn't that what life is all about? It's about the journey and, and, and as, as Ed said, the persistence of making it through. Uh, as far as uh, this is concerned, please do, if you're a viewer, watch us on YouTube. If you're a listener, follow me wherever you get your podcast and also please check out my website career-resilience.com where there's more information so so thank you very much for joining ed and me and until we meet again